Hi, Fomedics. Welcome to the show. Today, we have a very special guest sitting right across from me. Um, if you go on YouTube, you'll be able to see it. But if you're on a podcast, oh, you can just hear it. So we have Ilya Constantine. He is a producer writer, and he just produced and co-wrote an action thriller feature film, Unchained, starring Mayor Mulroney. Did I say that right? Yeah, you did. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Ilya. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, it's so great to have you. Um, you're so young and it's amazing. So, uh, Ellie, I want to ask you, can you let everyone know where we're recording um, in the world today? <laughs> let know what? Let the audience know where we're recording from today. Oh, today we're actually sitting at my very, very good friend, O's. <laughs> Uh, at uh, El Segundo. He, he has a, an awesome podcast studio over here and he let us borrow it. Yeah, so thank you so much. It's oh, The studio's name is... Oz, what is your the name of your studio? <laughs> There's no name it's yet. It's private. It's private. They're st <laughs> still developing it. So we're in a secret, undisclosed location on El Segundo Beach that is mm -hmm. um, in California past Torrance, right? Around Torrance, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we're here with Ilya, producer-writer. And uh, Ilya, I want to ask you, so when you were growing up, what was one of your favorite films? Okay. So personally, my favorite film, it's not just one film, it's a trilogy. It's The Lord of the Rings. Nice. Absolutely <laughs> love that film. Uh, and um, yeah, th that, that's actually the, the, the film that got me into filmmaking. When I, when I saw, so it's interesting because I saw the second, uh, the two towers first. And when I watched it in the movie theaters, it absolutely blew my mind. I, it's funny. I have a memory that I clearly remember how I came to the movie theater and how I sit down and how the opening scene started playing. And then I, I black out. That's it. I don't remember anything else. The next memory that I have is like me walking out of the movie theater and just being in that state of awe like it, it's insane i totally went into a new different universe and i just submerged into this un universe and like i that movie magic effect that that film had on me totally blew my mind and i think that was actually the moment when i kind of like i started for the first time having ideas about movies and like um that maybe this is something i'll be interested to do And then, and then from there, actually, from The Lord of the Rings, I started watching all other films, just binge watching everything. <laughs> so I'm going to have to ask you, what part of the movie theater do you like? Middle, front, back, side? <laughs> Probably middle, right? Like right in the middle, middle. Middle, middle, you know, right. The best seat, the best seat in the house. Do you do you popcorn? <laughs> yes, popcorn with caramel. I do. I like to add M&Ms in there. I'm a sweet tooth. Oh, yeah, but, yeah. But no soda, just water. Milk duds, milk duds, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you just... You don't rem you you had the experience, but it was just so blown away. And you watched uh, the towers first. Did mm -hmm. you watch number one next or yes. number three? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I came. Uh, well, the three didn't come up yet. So like, I watched the first time, uh, first one, a uh, second one, and then I came home. And I believe like the next day, I immediately found uh, the Fellowship of the Ring, and I watched it on on my TV. Also, just fell in love, fell in love with the the film. Um, the story, the characters, just the writing, direct, everything. Just everything about that movie, I still consider to this day perfect. Perfect. Yeah. It, it is an extraordinary, amazing film that does take you into this world. Absolutely. So uh, did you watch it with your brothers, sisters? Where were you at? Where did you grow up? By myself. By yourself? <laughs> yeah, totally by myself. Uh, it's funny, my... No one else in my in my family like movie geeks like me, and never always, ne never been. Um, and I grew up in Russia, so middle of the nowhere, uh, Siberia. If somebody is interested to look it up, it's called Je Chelyabinsk. It's funny, my manager calls it Jelly Beans. <laughs> Jelly Beans. Uh, yeah, so it, the town called Chelyabinsk. Grew up over there, um, and uh, like, yeah, just totally got obsessed by movies it's just a weird fluke in my life that happened um fell in fell in love with films and uh, since that moment i got obsessed about filmmaking and never stopped to this day 
That's beautiful. And did you um, have a favorite director that you like that you started watching some of his films? Hmm. Favorite director. Hmm. Good question. Let me think. I don't want to say Peter Jackson because we already named the Lord of the Rings, <laughs> but like I would definitely call him uh, one of the best directors there. Let's go with Spielberg, and I'll say why. Not because I'm a cliche, but simply because how he re- redefined storytelling and uh, character building. And it's like it's not about the story itself, how complex or awesome it is. It's about how you tell the story. And I think Spielberg is absolutely master of storytelling through directing, through you know scene by scene, and then at the same time developing the character arc. And when you watch his films, isn't it always like he takes you on this roller coaster of uh, just emotions, all the emotions that you can experience watching the film from being excited, scared, amazed, you know, how he was using special effects in his films back in those days. Just, you know, he just pushed the entire movie industry so much forward through his work and through his directing and storytelling. So, um, yeah. He- that- I mean, I remember crying through E.T., like, Mm -hmm. oh, my God, and, like, The Goonies, just Mm -hmm. such a fun, adventurous thing. And then Jaws and then all his other incredible films. Jaws is just amazing, (laughs) amazing thriller. Yeah. I remember when it was at the Universal lot with the Jaws. You can ride the train and they Mm -hmm. have the Jaws Yeah, I've been to those, yeah. (laughs) So you're in this town in Russia, Jelly Beans. How can you say it again? Chelyabinsk. Chelyabinsk? Chelyabinsk. Chelyabinsk. <laughs> <laughs> you can call it jelly beans. Okay, okay, so jelly beans. Don't don't hate me, Russia. I just, cause, uh, coming from Russia with love. So yeah. you're in Russia. Please, Putin, don't kill us. <laughs> so how did you get from Russia to Los Angeles and start going on this journey to okay. filmmaking? So the way I got here, there's this machine that is called a plane. <laughs> so you board it and then you <laughs> fly it over. Um, but it, yeah, it's... Um, I think around 16 years old, I got into studying English and kind of like at the same time, you know, I I was just, I was one of those weird kids who discovered my passion very early. So I'm very fortunate for that, that around that, you know, 15, 14, I already knew what I want to do, even though I initially wanted to be an actor, actually, because it's like a whole another different story because uh, when I was young, uh, I looked a lot like Jim Carrey and I was getting led a lot from people and that was my mechanism for getting popularity in school and that kind of thing. So I wanted to be in the movies, but I wanted to be an actor. So I I, I made that dream in my head that I'm going to be living in New York, not in LA, but I said, I'm going to be, I'm going to be like an actor, big star in New York. And since that age, I, I really worked my ass off on my acting skills, on my studying English and just preparing myself and my parents that, hey, as soon as I'm 18 years old, I'm actually going to the United States. I'm going to America. Um, obviously, first couple of years, parents is like, it's fine. He's just a kid. He's just talking. But I never stopped talking. I constantly, I was just obsessed about films, about acting, uh, about theater, of course, because uh, there's not much uh, opportunities in film where I'm from, but we had some theater going on. So I went to extracurriculum school. Uh, I went to like a special school to study film and TV a little bit, like when I was, what, 16 and a half, maybe turning 17. Um, yeah. And then through that path, kind of like I, I made my parents realize that he, he, he is going to leave at some point because he's so obsessed and probably like at, at 17, we started like me and my whole family, like working together. I was doing summer jobs, collecting money, putting it aside. Um, my parents helped me to put some money aside. And uh, eventually when I turned 18, uh, I was in my second year in college doing uh, theater arts. And yeah, I just kind of like decided it is time. To go into the machine, that plane. <laughs> yeah, to go into the machine. And, you know, I got um, got some papers done, got my visa. And uh, uh, at 18 years old, I moved to New York. Kind of crazy. 
oh my gosh, you moved by yourself to New York at the Big Apple. And, mm-hmm. it, and, and can I ask you, like, when you were studying in Russia, did you see some films that ins- maybe inspired you, like something for the Criteria Collection that you liked? Um, was there any films in there that, like, maybe said, wow, that is something spectacular? At that time? Mm-hmm. Mm. Actually, yeah, it's funny. I remember I watched Apocalypse Now and how it blew my mind. Absolutely blew my mind. Even though at that time I didn't understand the movie, I didn't understand the, I, all it was that blew my mind is the scope, the shots, the the expensiveness of the film, how grand it is. Um, but I didn't understand the deep subtleties of the movie at that time. After like I already got familiar with American culture and everything, uh, history, then that movie impressed me even more on a deeper level. But uh, yeah, I. I remember that apocalypse now when I was in Russia. I just when I watched it, I, it, I was in awe of like that this is possible. Like somebody created it, and it was not you know at that time there was no such thing as CGI and that kind of thing. It was all real, you know, special effects. It's just absolutely mind blowing. So that movie really impressed me on like this wah ah level. You know, the the budget, the, the scale, um, acting, obviously just. Just incredible acting. Dennis Hopper mm-hmm. character was just, I mean, he he really was extraordinary. Is and, extraordinary. And you know what's also interesting? Third time the movie blew me away. Once I researched how the movie actually was done and all the challenges and obstacle, obstacles uh, Francis Ford Coppola was facing. Because there's, this, uh, um, there's a YouTube uh, documentary you can find how the movie was actually made. And it's absolutely bananas. <laughs> like, if you have not seen that documentary about how they made Apocalypse Now, go watch it. It's absolutely crazy how much, call it, let's call it challenges, how, how, how many challenges and how much a one man had to overcome. Not obviously by himself, he had, he had a team, but he was like, you know, in charge of, of entire production. And all the craziness when people say real Hollywood movie, that that's what it is it's insane mind-blowing so you're so you, you just seen this apocalypse now you're in the big apple so what was your first apartment your first job like can you tell us like your journey in new york yeah oh my god <laughs> you're by yourself yeah, in new york <laughs> i was living with like other 10 or 11 kids in the house that's like a one giant shared house um, and my first job was in this company that's called Send in the Clowns. Maybe this boss, Gary, is listening to me. Hi, Gary. <laughs> um, the, my, job, my, my first job was like setting up and breaking down parties, um, like f- physical work. You know, like it, somebody has a birthday party, you set up tables, chairs, like that, that kind of thing. Um, that was my first job in New York. I was living in this house uh, full of other immigrant kids. Um, you know, working, doing their kid stuff. Uh, and I wasn't really pursuing acting in the first month and a half. I was just exploring the city, trying to trying to learn the language, learn the culture, kind of like um, working, saving money, like just, just getting to know life. Because you got to realize, I, I went from living in the house, living with parents, kind of like all your needs are met, and uh, to a place where you totally have to take care of yourself from everything. I had to learn how to cook food, how to do laundry, <laughs> like all, all of these things. So I had to grow up very, very quickly. And then New York also punched me in the face many, many times. Um, I had to learn very quickly over there. Um, I can tell you a crazy story if you want to hear it. Yeah, our it's audience a, wants to hear, it's right? It's <laughs> so I, um, let's call it we were like two months uh, living in New York. And uh, due to another crazy story, we had to move out of the house. All the all the kids were kicked out of the house that where we lived. So we had to find a new apartment. So we go on Craigslist. We, we find this apartment in Queens. Uh, and uh, big, like 20-story building. We meet with the landlord, who is this uh, 
Russian, Armenian, something. I don't, I don't even know. He speaks half English, half Russian. Like literally every other word, English, Russian, English, Russian. He talks like to us like that. And it was five of us, five kids looking for a place to move in because, you know, it's freaking expensive. We can't afford it. Uh, and um, so we meet with the landlord and he sees like, oh, you guys are five over here. You, you know, you cannot do this. You, you, it's only one person can actually live here. But we're like, well, we don't have money. And he's like, okay, whatever. Only one condition. You can go and live in the apartment if you're going to go through the back door. <laughs> and, and then you go upstairs. But no, make sure nobody sees you. Because it's very it's against the, the law and whatever. You be. Only one person can live in the apartment. We're like, all right, fine. So we go to the, you know, when we looked at the apartment, it's completely empty. Uh, no furniture, nothing, just em- empty rooms, uh, half broken kitchen. The, the stove is from like 1960s or whatever. Um, well, we don't have a choice, so we move in, you know, uh, no document check, no like signing a lease, no documents, nothing, no IDs, no papers. Just we paid a deposit of $3,000 and $3,000 for the first month. So we gave him $6,000. A week goes by, we live in this apartment. I sleep on the floor. Everybody's sleeping on the floor. We, we, we found some cupboards on the street just to put it on the floor <laughs> to sleep a little bit, uh, you know, so a little bit softer. So second week, I wake up because my, waist is, my, my face is getting wet. And I open my eyes and I look around and I literally see the apartment is flooded. It's flooding. I, 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 and then I kind of like, I'm still trying to wake up. I look to my left and I see the door to the restroom is open and the water from the restroom is just keep floating oh. and floating and floating. And then it's going to get gross. <laughs> oh. And then I literally see a poop just floating <laughs> across the room. Oh. And people are freaking out. Like my roommates are freaking out. And I ask, what's going on? What happened? And my friend says, uh, yeah, he went, used the restroom and now it's all broken. It's like, you know, we need to shut down the water. So one of us runs down to the security. Security comes up. He shuts down the water. We finally stop the water, you know. And then he turns to us and he says, what are you guys doing here? We're like, we'll live here. What do you mean live here? You cannot live here. The apartment building is closed for demolishing. You can't be here. You have to get out of here right now. And I was like, hmm, now I understand why I don't see people in the building. Oh, that is, that is a shyster and a scammer that he... Yep, he, so we, we got kicked out of the building on the street, on the street. Called the guy, tell him what happened. He's like, okay, stay there, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come. And never came up, never showed up. $6,000, just like that, in one week, oh. gone. That he could do that to five kids, like the heartless people. Some people are heartless. It's like, you got to write a story about that. That's why they like, I guess the characters, the evil guy, they're heartless. The villains, they're heartless. Mm-hmm. They can just take from the innocent. That's why we have so many superhero movies, I guess, because yeah. the good have to go get the bad guy. Yeah, he totally took advantage of us. Oh, and, that is... Uh, but that's New York, you know. That's everywhere. New York, New York yeah, it's everywhere. <laughs> it's everywhere. <laughs> But that was a good, you know, lesson into checking everything before you move in. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. You're like, all because if he didn't like flood the toilet, y'all could have stayed yeah. there a little bit longer. <laughs> yeah. And then from from there on, we were, me and my friend, we were literally homeless in New York for, for about two weeks, sleeping in subways and stuff. Oh. Or, or like a week and a half. Uh, um, luckily... I'm 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 one of those very fortunate people, uh, and parents helped me out to get off the street and find an apartment. So I was very lucky, fortunate. Oh, mommy and daddy, thank you for yes, mom, rescuing dad, thank you. your son yeah. from the streets of New York yes. because there's rats there, right? <laughs> yeah, this big. We were hunting too because like there was no food, so I had to make a bow and a spear and hunt some New York rats, <laughs> make a fire. Oh my them. gosh. It, that's a good time to learn to play guitar so somebody can give you some money or do poetry or I don't yeah. know, right? You know, tell oh, jokes. It was brutal. Finding a job as an illegal immigrant, that's brutal. It's it's not fun. Not fun at all. So so you're in New York, you finally got an apartment. 
you're working for Sin and the Clowns, which pe- teaching you pretty much like setting up props, breaking down props, like kind of like show business, right? Like you have to set up the props, make sure everything's right, you know, studios, props, sets, set design. <laughs> you, you could, yeah, it was like a PA job. Right? In some sense. <laughs> At least it's, you know, you're getting some skills in there. <laughs> but that was only in the beginning. That was like way, way in the beginning. And, and then after that, once like I got out of the streets, I moved into another shared house with an, another bunch of students. Um, I got lucky that I was actually able to do some background jobs for a little bit of cash. Uh, and my, my rent at that house was like super cheap. I paid, was it 500 or $400 for a bunk bed? Because that's what it was. It was just like, you know, one giant room with 10 bunk beds. And like I was sleeping on one of the bunk beds. Um but eventually from New York, I made my way to L.A. because one of my friends, she also moved to L.A. And he hooked me up with an immigration lawyer who decided to take my case and help me help me out to do this whole immigration process, which is another set of challenges for an immigrant. And the, the point was I'm trying to get is like my first two and a half years, even yeah, two first two and a half years, I wasn't even able to fully commit to acting or business because I was an illegal immigrant getting legal. Although I became, I was legally to stay in the United States um, pretty pretty much immediately when I got here to, to LA, but I was illegal to work. So I was I was legal to live and do my thing and do whatever I want, but I was illegal to work. And that stopped me from doing any kind of show business activity. Because the first thing they're asking, especially when you hear your accent, is like, do you have papers? Obviously, no. You don't have social security. You don't have work permit. You cannot get on any kind of set, even in a, as a background. So that was extremely challenging. But once I got through all that and I got my work permit and, and I, I I started doing a lot of background. Like as soon as I got my work permit, I immediately started doing background. Called central casting, got some calling service. And I was working a lot, doing a lot of background. And that was when actually my learning process started really because I was on set of big shows and uh, big films. Just I was one of those background who never sat around in the like background holding area i was constantly there on set just standing somewhere in the corner watching very closely and learning studying what is everybody's doing who is what um studying all the film slang and you know terms apple box what is apple box that kind of thing (laughs) Yeah, it's good. It's nice when you can kind of see the stuff and get the lingo and learn. It's like, Mm -hmm. that's helpful. And so you're learning on the set um, as a dedicated person. Because I think a lot of people got discovered. Like you get discovered, you meet people, you're on the set. I think Harrison Ford was uh, Mm -hmm. a carpenter on set, you know? So, and then you see Harrison Ford now. I kind of did get my breakthrough background too one time. It's funny. I was just sitting around, you know, on set. It was a... um, it was ABC pilot that they were shooting pilot. And that one of the producer walks in a, onto like background holding area and says, who's here speaks Russian. It's like, I do. He's like, let's go. <laughs> right on. He brings me to set. He walks me to this actor. He says, um, Oh no, no, no. They brought me to this Russian actress who didn't speak a word in English and they had a hard time communicating with her. Uh, and, uh, they're like, can you translate for us to her? What, you know, and so I became a translator for this Russian actress who is like one of the, I guess she was, she was a guest star, I guess, or co-star, some, some, one of those, either guest star or co-star, and I started translating for her. And they were so grateful to me that I did a pretty good job that they said, we're going to give you a speaking part. They said, like, stay over here and just improv in Russian with this guy. And that's how I got my, you know, official actor co-star or guest star what is less co-star. Co- co- co-star co-star is less so i got my co-star contract sag contract right then and there signed the papers i became sag eligible it was like wow it, it's crazy the legends are real you can get discovered just <laughs> on set by you know being lucky i guess 
<laughs> yeah, hey, I met I met the manager at the post office with my dog. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I felt like, hey, it's like those swab, the other place, like all the Lana Turners and stuff, I think. They mm-hmm. all got discovered at the swab pharmacy mm-hmm. in Hollywood. So yeah. you're like, really? Can that really happen? And I'm like, so it's nice. You, you never know. Hold on you to those know. dreams. And actually, that Russian lady, I became friends with her and I started trying translating more for her and eventually when i was looking for an agent manager i reached out to her and she connected me to my manager that's amazing that's a beautiful story so like you know a lot of people you know it's not like exactly the, the most glamorous funnest job to be mm-hmm. background let's face it you want to talk and you see everyone else getting to talk and and you yeah. know but the fact that you were in there meeting the people and you got your lucky break mm-hmm. because you had a special skill you could but you know what's interesting? You said like, oh, it's not the funnest job. And to me, that was the best job in the world at that time. I absolutely loved. In fact, it was so hard for me to quit background and move on forward with my career. I didn't want to do it because I was in love. To me, growing up in like in Russia and watching all those b-roll footages of how they made in movies movies about movies and you know and just like when you sit there without any opportunities and all you have is your imagination and you're visualizing the stuff that oh man someday i'm gonna be on set someday i'm gonna see it and then when i got to my first set even as a background it totally blew my mind i was like oh my god i am here (laughs) I am here. I'm watching this stuff. All these lights, cameras, people running around, crafty. They're giving you free food, free <laughs> snacks, and they're paying you good money for that. That At that time, doing background was like the best thing ever. I absolutely loved it. That's that's a, such a beautiful story. So you so you did you move on eventually? I <laughs> had to. Yeah, I had to quit background. It was very challenging because... Also, I was one of those like stubborn kids at that time. I made a, this promise to myself that I'm not going to get any job except something to do with entertainment, which hurt me. Um, and that was like, I was auditioning a lot and I considered auditioning my job, but nobody pays you to audition, even though you do this all day long. And for... About a year and a half, maybe even two years, I was very like struggling money wise financially because of me being stub- stubborn and not wanting to get a, a job. I just wanted to do acting, only acting, 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 acting. Eventually, that choices that I made led me to being homeless because um, I couldn't pay for apartment anymore. So. And still, even being homeless, I was still being very stubborn. I got, I started doing Lyft, like Lyft around that time came along. uh, And I was one of the first Lyft drivers, actually. So I was doing a little bit of Lyft on on the side to make some money for like food and and lunch and whatever. But for the most part, I was just auditioning and self-studying, reading books. Actually, around that time, I started writing. That's when the writing came along. Because it was one of the, those things I, I thought, you know what, to, for me to be a good actor, I need to understand storytelling and writing. So even though it was challenging financially wise at that time, it was one of the most productive times of my life because I was so committed and so focused and I had no destruction, like no TV, no, no nothing, just books, auditioning, books, reading, acting class. And I was going to acting class. Funny, I didn't have money to afford to pay for an apartment, but I was putting that money for it towards an acting class. <laughs> Hilarious. Uh, yeah, a lot of people do that, and you wake up one day and go, oh, you know, maybe I should just pay for like a, a coach when I have like a scene I need help with. But it's, you know, it's one of those things like, yeah, acting, it, the business takes a certain amount of money, but you, you're a testimony that like you came from Russia, you found yourself. Living in your car, right? Mm-hmm. I was living in the car. Hey, Tyler Perry. Look at Tyler Perry. Like, yeah. you know, he owns studios in Atlanta. Like, yeah. he made it huge, you know? So there's, yeah. it, it's almost like, you know, if, you, if you're if you born rich, obviously it's easier if you're born into the business. But you, you know, I think that's where artists can um, draw from their inspiration, that pain to write mm-hmm. really great stories. Yeah. That's what maybe I think 
is at least some con- kind of consolation that you, those stories yeah. come from living through yeah. those really highs and lows. That it you wasn't have. all that bad, too. You know, despite the fact financially it was hard, but it was very romantic. I, I made it all romantic for myself, especially when uh, after about like a month and a half uh, of living in the car, my neck started really bothering me. So I, I, I kind of like had to figure out another way where to sleep. So and I found a spot, a very special spot. I still have pictures on my phone. It, it, it's insane. So what do you what's uh, what's the canyon that goes right across the street from Warner Brothers? Do you remember? Is it cold water? Uh, maybe Coldwater Canyon oh, yeah. no. or Coenga, Coenga. Forest Lawn. A Forest Lawn, yeah. Forest Lawn Street. Mm-hmm. So whatever canyon is across that street, and again, it's on the side of Warner Brothers Studios. So the actual canyon is on the other side of the mountain, which is like Hollywood area. But you know, the mountain is big. So on that side, on the Warner Brothers side, which is Burbank, um, it's kind of like fenced off area. Nobody really goes there. Uh, there's no hiking trails, nothing like that. And one day I just snuck, I, I kind of like, I crawled under the, the fence because there's just a hole there. I crawled in just exploring. And then there, there was a hill. I climbed on top of the hill and I looked around and you can see entire Warner Brothers studio. I was like, wow, that's really beautiful. And then I see these like bushes and the bushes make this little entrance like arc in the middle. And I go through that arc going behind the bushes on the other side and there's this little like platform oh and i'm surrounded by like little trees and bushes and there's a little platform right there and i sat down looking over the warner brothers studio and i said "Hmm, i can sleep here i went to where i went i don't remember where i went but i bought like a ten dollar um tent pitched it right in between the bushes and I started sleeping there. Oh, I also found a door. I found a door. I, <laughs> I dragged the door <laughs> up the hill to make it flat because, like, you're on the ground. You can't sleep. So I put in the door. I put in the tent on top of the door and, like, brought blankets, put everything, made it a little bit, you know, soft. Uh, and that's where I was sleeping. Sounds kind of a little bit uh, like the Hobbit. You made a little Hobbit, ah, a little Hobbit, right? Yeah, yeah. Know, right? You, you made yeah. a little Hobbit house, right? Yeah. <laughs> but the reason why it's so romantic is because you know I'm an inspired actor. I want to be in the movies and everything, and I'm falling asleep every night, and I'm literally he- hearing people yelling and action, and cut, <laughs> go again. And they're speaking through that, uh, what is that? Microphone. Yeah, yeah. The walkie-talkies or? No, not the walkie-talkie. For the director, the director. The bullhorn. Yeah, yeah. And action. So you're living your dream. Your, 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 your TV set is the Warner Brothers exactly. lot. Action. And cut. I'm falling asleep. I'm visualizing, you know, being on set, being an actor and that kind of thing. So it, it was romantic. Hard, but romantic. So, so I love your positive the way you just made it so positive, like when you were an or you know, you made it like amazing journey and visualizing and learning as much as you can. And then here you are in this position that's, you know, not the funnest position. You made it like work for you and like look at them and like visualize and see yourself being on the lot as a producer, writer, director, actor, successful. And you made this journey that you had to go through because, you know, mm-hmm. during COVID, so many people lost their jobs, business closed just many artists like aren't financially well off. And even if you're from America, like the hardships that they go, like they'll mm-hmm. spend every dime to go to an acting class and acting classes are like $500 a month. And then you need your, you know, you need headshots and then you need these looks and you got to have the money to go on the auditions. Mm-hmm. And nowadays I think it's a little bit better. They can do self tapes. They do take a long time, but at least you don't have to drive around cause that's money for gas. You got to take off work. So mm-hmm. maybe you can do your self tape at night and it kind of helps you, like, if you have to work, that at least you have a time to, maybe when you come home from work, you do yeah. it at night or in the morning before you go to your job. But Actually, everything you just described was a strong considering fact for me quitting acting and not quitting the business, quitting specifically acting. Because I felt that I'm putting in so much work for so many years and I'm getting nothing, almost nothing in return. You know, all, all, it's like you keep investing into the business that doesn't 
get get up and running, so to speak. So how long can you keep investing? And uh, it was not just because of that reason. I think I also, I don't know. There there was a point where I actually got a serious regular on on this like a mini TV show, and I got everything that I dreamed of uh, in when you talk about acting wise. Like I had my trailer, I had my these mini scripts. You know, you sit in the makeup chairs, you get your lines, your everything. It was not a big part, but I was one of the serious regular, constantly hanging out there. You know, being one of the people who made it. And I, it wasn't clicking. It's so, it was so weird. Like I got there and I'm supposed to be the happiest person in the world. And for some reason I was not. Although I enjoyed the hell out of it. Like wow. A, a lot. So see, he went from his Hobbit house mm-hmm. <laughs> to making a series regular on a TV show. Are you allowed to share yeah. what show that was or anything? Or yeah, it? it's called Tales of Titans. You can, you can look it up. Tale, Tales of Titans. Tales of Titans. And what was your character? Yeah. Um, my name of the character was Cosmonaut. Cosmonaut. That, ah, oh, Cosmonaut. Because I'm Russian. Yeah. So it's funny. I'll tell you, uh, how I got that part. It was funny. Um, so I just get an audition and I go to, what is it? La Brea. Uh, so just the casting director in, in Hollywood, right? I walk in, I didn't know that it's a comedy and I thought it's something like dramatic and you have to be all serious and everything about it. So I walk into the room and they, they ask me to like, okay, we're going to read you lines, but you're going to reply in Russian to us. I was like, okay, sure. Yeah, we can do that. And as they're saying lines, I'm reply, replying in Russian, but I'm like, I'm all dramatic. I'm all serious. And all of a sudden, the casting directors start rolling on the floor. They're laughing. And I'm like... I'm kind of like, hmm, this, <laughs> is, this is not good, <laughs> shit. But I'm already in character. got to keep going. I get Maybe it's a good sign. I don't know. So I just keep going. And they're saying things to me, and I'm, I'm a, I, I reply in Russian, totally serious, dead serious, like all super all like dramatic, like real dramatic, you know, not over the top, overacting, but just real, very real. And then the switch would do the same thing in English. They keep laughing. And I walk out, and I'm like, well... That's that. <laughs> I never see you again. It was that bad. <laughs> it was terrible. I was embarrassed. <laughs> and what? A week later, they tell me I book it. Ooh. Not even a callback. Nothing. Just you booked it. <laughs> that that's the best. Like whoa, you booked it. You know. Yeah. They make you sweat that week, though. You're mm-hmm. like that whole week. You're like. <laughs> oh, I wasn't even thinking. No, it was it was embarrassing. I was like, oh, man, that was, that was terrible because I legit thought it was something dramatic. And I had to be dramatic. And when casting directors are laughing that hard during dramatic audition, it's not a good sign. But then later, once I got to set, they told me, like, I, and I got the script. I was like, oh, it's actually funny. And it was a company, Funny or Die. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I get to my first fitting, and I met the director, and he walks up to me. He's like, man, you are hilarious. <laughs> so i was like okay i'm just gonna keep doing this whatever i'm doing so everybody are the the whole show was about gamers like we're all professional gamers and we're all like actually not we're good but we're all kind of crazy in their in our own way so i'm that russian character who doesn't speak english all my lines were like straight up straight up in russian and i'm like all serious i'm taking this game super serious i'm like (laughs) i love it I'm like super serious. Uh, it's life or death for me. That was my character. I love it. So, but then you found like, um, you, you, you made it, you made it, you mm-hmm. made it. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, but maybe, you know, cause, um, I had another guest and, you know, that came on the show super like, oh my God, o- Oscars and Emmys. And he said that, um, like as an actor, there'd be highest highs. He'd book all this stuff and there was lowest lows. Mm-hmm. And he even said that he would, disguise himself and would sell flowers because he you know it's kind of like you know when he was the low periods when you weren't booking work but then he ended up going into the studio system as a producer and became like this huge producer so mm-hmm. i think art is like you can do acting you can do writing you can do directing you can do producing sets uh, music whatever but there might be one that like starts blooming that you have this affinity for so mm-hmm. you you actually made what like 
your dream came true when you're in this funny character and you're doing comedy because mm-hmm. comedy's like you have a good time, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so then what happens? Time. Talk to us. Like you're on the show that was like, I want to be a serious regular. Oh my God. Like that. It's like, you know, so many people's dreams are like, going, mm-hmm. Oh, he did it. And, but the hardship that you had to endure yeah. that like, you know, you were able to, your mind was able to make it a great journey. A lot, not a lot of people's mind. Um, some people like, I'm very sensitive or emotional, maybe like, but you steered your mind to keep it strong and steer your ship because sometimes, and when you're in a certain situation, like it's like your outlook in your mind. So you have like this brilliant outlook. So you're there, you're on the set, you're being funny. Everyone loves you. You're having a good time. I'm assuming on set, right? Mm-hmm. So tell us then what's next. Well, that's when things started going in the, I don't want to say wrong direction because I end up in a position that a lot of people kind of like starting out when they're young, which is they don't know what to do with themselves. I never had that problem. I always wanted, I always knew what I want to do with my life. And then I'm here, I'm serious regular. My dreams are coming to fruition. I'm getting paid. I have my trailer, I have everything. And for some reason, I feel something is off. And then during the production, I push these thoughts away because, you know, I'm just, I'm here. I'm, I'm going to be focused on, on that. But once the production is over, that's when it kind of hit me that I didn't say I don't want to do it anymore because it's hard to admit yourself. You, know, you got to understand the psychological thing of, of a human mind, you know, something you dream about since like 14 years old, 15, you've been dreaming about this. You, you went across the country, I mean, across the ocean, you get to a new country, new language, new everything, wholeness, struggle, all, all the stuff that you've done to be a successful actor. And now I have to tell myself that this is not what I want to do. That really messed up my brain so to speak and um that's when i kind of like i started thinking well maybe there's something else i need to do with my life I, and i kind of like started getting into different partnership tried a business tried uh, mm, i tried copywriting like stuff that has nothing to do with with filmmaking and that also didn't like that was totally wrong I I felt that, no, this is not right. After trying different things, I came back into acting, but I kept feeling like acting is not it. So like, what do I have to do? What do I got to do? And at the same time, I was writing a lot, actually. I started writing. I continued my writing, uh, kind of like hobby. It was a hobby. I was just writing a lot, the scripts. And I was reading a lot of scripts, too. Uh, But only as a hobby. And so at some point, me and my kind of like my close associates, the friends, partners, we were just sitting around and kind of like we somehow got got on the conversation about maybe we can make our own movie. And that's how it started. So I got into producing. We started producing our first film. And in the process of producing, I absolutely fell in love with producing. Like, absolutely. It's just, and that was such a relief to me because it finally, everything that I kind of have been working and doing uh, throughout my whole, like, you know, acting stuff, because it wasn't just acting. It was just, you know, reading books about cinema and this and studying a little bit of directing, the lights. I did some sound PPA, like all kinds of different things within the film industry. I did all that, all that. And uh, when I started producing, all of those things clicked in my mind. Everything came together. And that was like, oh my God, this is what I actually want to do. I want to produce. And on top of it, that producing uh, job also goes along very well with my natural abilities that nature gave me that I always had something I got from my parents both of my parents are business people business minded so um, I kind of got exposed very early on to leadership to building a business to finances and all of that thing all of these things but I never 
they never came to like front front of the conscious. It was always in the back of the conscious, if it makes sense. And so now all of my movie knowledge combined with my natural skills that I have into producing. So like, and I felt like fish in the water producing. And I got incredibly high off of producing. I still am getting incredibly high off producing. Call me weird. It's crazy. But when stuff go wrong, when challenges arrive, and arise and you know all the stuff was kind of like falling apart and you're the guy who steps up to the challenge and comes in and fixes and running around when there's no time to think and you have to make split second decisions that is where i thrive this is what i get high off of of that feeling of being unstoppable and i truly like when i'm in the zone in the zone of producing when i'm on set and i have to fix things and, f- and find solutions that is just incredible to me. That's what I like. I I got hooked on that feeling. And now I can't wait to make another film to experience that. I cannot wait to go into another production and fix problems and find solutions. Yeah, and can you tell us about like um, how you wrote, how you came up with, uh, did you come up with the concept of Un... un- we, we did together with my partners. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The action thriller. We were just sitting at Aroma on Sunset Boulevard, and uh, we actually started with that. Uh, no, we, we started with this. Like, all right, what do we have right now available to us? What we can use? And uh, one of my good friend, Mary Mulroney, an actress, she's an amazing actor. And we thought, you know, I kind of like I talked to her and I said, hey, Mayor, do you want to play a lead in a part? She said, yeah. Sure. What's the movie? I don't know. <laughs> like, okay, keep me posted. So I'll go back to my guys and say, okay, we have our lead actor, Mayor. What, what can we write for her? And based off of just the, having the lead actor attached, we started we cre- starting to create a story and whatever. And we said, we kind of like, we went through locations that are possibly we can access just from our friends, family, you know, acquaintances, whatever. We created a list of locations and we said, okay, we have, we put, we most likely can access these locations. What kind of movie can we write for these locations and for this actor that we have? That's when we like, okay, how about, when we also martial arts fan. So we also like, okay, we, since we're all martial arts fan, let's do something with fighting. <laughs> And that's and and that's that from from that kind of like resources that we have access to, we started you know spitballing ideas and log lines. Then we created a log line, and then you know eventually you write a story, you create a story. Um, we created with a title Unchained, uh, so it, it's essentially like a, a thriller action film where a a girl unfortunately gets kidnapped and thrown into this underground pit fights for rich people where they watch and make bets and like girls fight fight each other. So it's like underground fight club, um, but only for girls. And so it's about her journey, how she has to survive, how she you know she needs to be a leader and then eventually help to escape all uh, you know the girls and that kind of thing. And you also had like the other actors in it. You got Eric Roberts in it. Yeah, we got and- Eric Roberts. We got Bonafide wrestling star Taya Valkyrie. Taya Valkyrie's in it. Taya a, Valkyrie, yes. A, a wrestling star. Mm-hmm. So it's just, you, you get these actors in there and you have these locations. It starts coming together, coming together. And you wrote this. You co-wrote yeah. this. And yeah. you, you made your dreams happen. He made his dreams happen all the way from Russia. He came here and had to learn the language, learn how to write. Had, yeah. to, had to get his visa papers. He had to learn how to work. Yeah, and it's been a, it's been a you, journey. He became a, a series regular, like hardly all the actors. There's hundreds of thousands of actors, like actively auditioning, probably in LA, then around the world, uh, you know, land time, wherever. And you made it. Uh, people would, you know, like series regular on a TV show. That's someone's, you know, dream. Like if you can't be the lead, then it's series regular. And then mm-hmm. not only that, you achieve that, then you do a movie with Mayor, mm-hmm. Mayor Maroney, Maroney Robert, Eric, Eric Roberts. Roberts. 
and, to have Valkyrie. And and where can people see that? Like our listeners, like, oh, I want to go see that it's movie. It's on Amazon. You, you, you can find it on Amazon and buy it. Oh, it's also on. Is it on Tubi? Yeah, I believe it's on Tubi. You can find it on Tubi. So it's called Unchained. 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 Yes. Unchained. Yeah, like chained with un. So she's unchained. Unchained, and it's stream. Is it streaming on like is that uh, Amazon? Right? Is yes, that you can you can purchase it on Amazon or rent it. Uh, you can also watch it on Tubi. I believe it's Tubi. All right. And then we'll, we'll, we'll put in the summary. Um, we'll give yeah. you all of his information. So where does someone keep up with you, Ilya, like as your next project? Are you, are you on Twitter, or yeah. Instagram? I, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Ilya Constantine. It spells I-L-I-A Constantine, like the movie Constantine. Um, it's funny how I actually came up with the name. Uh, I, uh, my friend, we, we came, like we were walking on Hollywood Boulevard, probably second week of me here being here in L.A. And I was like, man. My real name, I'm going to, there you go. I'm going to throw it out there. My real name. My real name is Ilya Rusakov. And I was like, mm, yeah, nobody's going to, nobody's going to pronounce that. What is this? It, it's hard. My middle name is Constantine. I, wa- I watched the movie Constantine the day before we want, went on Hollywood Boulevard. And his name in the movie is John Constantine. So I thought to myself, that's interesting last name they're using constantine as last name so it's possible hold on my name is Ilya constantine rusakov so i can just drop my real last name and make my middle name i call it like a stage name so Ilya constantine but anyways that just i do little, like rusakov i'm probably saying it wrong but rusakov so no, you said it right yeah and you do look like jim carrey doesn't he he looks like a young jim carrey so you know if jim carrey needs a son you know they call him up Oh my God, I had this crazy idea. I wanted to pitch it to Jim Carrey, actually. That, um, <laughs> Jim Carrey, call, call. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jim, actually, I don't know if Jim is listening to this, but he, all, like, he was one of the, my first actors that I was looking up to. Because I was identified maybe with him so much, um, I was looking up to him. And I had this crazy idea to do Ace Ventura 3, where he's getting reunited with his son from Russia. And his son from Russia comes here to find him in order to, you know, he's doing his own investigation. Now he needs a father's help. And so like a father and son going, going together on an investigation as they figure out their own relationship. Because, you know. Yeah, maybe the studios will call. That's a good concept. I think people would go see that. I think yeah. he's doing like the cableman for the Super Bowl commercial, like a his cable guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that would be, I, Ace Ventura is so for funny, but like you look oh like God. his son and you're from Russia. That could be because of Borat was like a funny movie, right? From yeah. a different country. Mm-hmm. So maybe the exactly. studios will call you. Hey, Ilya. Like, hello, Debbie. Yeah. You know, you, you were writing that story. We heard on the podcast. So yeah, we want to do that. Jim Carrey said, let's do it. You know, let's he never it, knows. There's stranger things. There's podcasts stranger that get things. multi-million dollar deals with Amazon. Mm-hmm. So maybe Amazon executive is listening to you, seeing that you look like Jim Carrey, you write, you produce and, and I can act and I can be funny and I can imitate pretty much any act that Jim Carrey is doing with his face. I can do all these things too. Because like on YouTube, like where's your YouTube channel where they can go and watch? Ilya Constantine too. I-L-I-A Constantine. Um, I do want to talk about my YouTube channel because this is something special. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us about that. I, is that what you're working on now? Like, uh, Well, this is one of my projects, my personal projects that I started and I started developing. Right now I'm, I'm, I'm having a... Uh, scripted tv show that i'm working on uh, that i'm currently pitching around town looking for executives and showrunners to get attached to my project i truly believe i have gold i'm gonna say it out there i'm gonna put it out there i'm so confident that i the tv show that i have is absolute gold and is going to be made on hbo max i guarantee you guarantee you he's good at manifesting it's i'm not being cocky i'm being absolutely confident that somebody's gonna say yes I'm going to meet the right person and it's going to make its way on HBO Max. Absolutely. And it's a young, what do you, what do you describe it? It's like, uh, like Californication, Entourage. It's a, it's a young adult, right? Like Yes. You- it, the TV shows for young adults, it's something very contemporary, um, something that people will understand right now um, and will be able to identify very easy because the show is somewhat familiar to something that already has been done. So you said it right, actually. It's Entourage. Uh, meets Gossip Girl with like craziness 
and sexiness of Californication. And even on top of it, I want to throw this absolutely insane, over the top, luxurious lifestyle from Wolf of Wall Street. So, do you know, like when you watch The Wolf of Wall Street, the comedy comes not from funny jokes or funny lines, it's more of a, just the way the people live of this rich, insane lifestyle. So all that sprinkled on top of that, of the show, what, what I'm trying to communicate. So, and I legit have gold. I'm just going to say that out there. It is gold. It's a golden nugget and it's going to be a big hit. So the TV show that I'm working on, I'm also, um, currently I'm, I'm working on the feature film that I already, a, some actors getting attached. I don't want to say any names yet because nothing is finalized yet. And I would like to keep a little bit intrigued because my YouTube channel, what I'm starting is I'm starting, I don't have an official name for it yet, but it's pretty much going to be a producing vlog. I'm going to be vlogging entire producing process and the craziness that comes with producing (laughs) because during my, like, you know, kind of like as you go along on the producing and you start witnessing the things that are happening behind the scenes... It's absolutely fascinating. And I believe people need to see all that. People need to see all the shenanigans behind the scene because it's so much fun. It's hilarious. Yeah, Steve Buscemi was in a movie. I forget the name of it, but it was so funny. It was about making a movie. Do you remember that movie, Steve Buscemi? It was was like he was a director on set and all the shenanigans on there. I forget the name of the movie, but um, it was so hilariously funny. It was He was the director... And everything that could go wrong on set. And it was a movie. I forget the name at the top of my head, but um, you guys probably know that they're listening to this. Well, it's like the, the Disaster Artist, if, if you want to say that. <laughs> you know, movie about movie. Oh, what about uh, Ed Wood um, movie with uh, Johnny Depp? Also, uh, it's like, accordingly, according to the Google, it's like about the worst director ever, that kind of thing. Um <laughs> Which, you know, all these things are just opinions and subjective, but it's also like about movie making. So I just thought to myself, when I started producing for the first time, what was interesting to me is there's no knowledge available online. There's hardly any books, hardly any articles about producing. Hardly anybody gives you actual real advice on producing and how to make it and what producing is. There's a joke in the industry is going on when people ask what does producer do? I don't know. Well, on this show, we have producers and they do talk. So we try to get them like as much as they can help us out with how they made it. And like, yeah. you know, but and they uh, never can you actually give a defined answer because producer is kind of doing everything, everything from developing, writing, finding rights, attaching actors, finding finances, you know, leading the production, uh, executing the vision. It's, it's just everything it's a lot of work especially if you're doing it independently on a low budget or no budget like i can attest to that Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's like you're the director writer aid you're your own ad your own pa your own you have to wear many hats you have to your own craft service and in charge of wardrobe oh my gosh we had like um we were filming at the hollywood the lake hollywood and below the hollywood sign Mm -hmm. And we had like FBI outfits and sheriff outfits. And the, the guy was a real cop. He goes, well, the sheriff's outfits, it's, they wear the brown uniforms and the FBI outfits are the black. And do you need this gun or this gun and the stars? And he just, it was like so complicated. And it had like over $3,000 worth of, of wardrobe that there, I didn't have no, I didn't have a assistant. I'm already the director. I'm already the producer, my own AD and PA and craft service. And now I'm in charge of like over three thousand dollars. That like so many details, the stars and the pins and the this uniform and that uniform. And then we had guns. We had the FBI um, machine guns. Mm-hmm. No permits. I had no permits. No insurance. And we're filming near the Hollywood sign where they have like all the cameras oh and stuff like that. And there's people jogging with their dogs. And I'm like, and the guy, it was, it was like one of the hottest days in LA. Like mm-hmm. I think it was like 90 degrees yeah. and the guys are sweating and they had these, you know, machine guns that look like machine guns, like prop guns. And I'm like, when, when we're not on there, cover them with a towel or a sheet, you know? And then the guys would forget and people would jog by and, but they're so used to like people filming in LA that they're like, yeah. oh, they didn't know, they didn't know that we weren't like <laughs> yeah but yeah gorilla crew yeah gorilla so it's yeah but um it's it, you get that thrill that high yeah. you're like oh my gosh but i was one person i did need 
a, a proper AD and a PA. It would have been so nice to have some some help because you're doing everything and the yeah. actors don't remember their lines and yeah. and then like oh we <laughs> it would alien it were, you know it was an alien spaceship that crashed and like the the medical team and the yellow outfits with the the mask mm -hmm. and it's 90 90 some degrees and, like and those yellow plastic suits one girl was passing out and like the other guy couldn't do it i had to go in and be one of the people and i'm directing as the person picking up the alien body and like couldn't see the shot so it, it is it just becomes what it is and you just is, like you exactly. said like you said you just everyone's there get stuff in the can get stuff in the can exactly. get the shots and yeah <laughs> luckily with unchained well, I had my partners, and we kind of like became three men army. I love it. Constantly supporting each other and helping each other out with absolutely everything. So in that sense, I uh, I'm lucky. So like, if I would give one piece of advice for low budget filmmakers filmmakers who are looking to break in, it's just find like minded people. You don't need that many. Three, four people are enough, and then you delegate all the tasks between ourselves. You know, um, and you help each other. But you need that. You know, three, four people who are like like minded, absolutely determined with you, who are not going to, you know, cry and run away when the pressure is going to hit you in the face because it's going to happen. So like before you go in, you almost have to swear to each other. Hey, guys, we're not going to abandon. We're going to get to the end because that's actually the hardest thing with filmmaking, with, with, with um, making films is getting to the end, putting one in the can. And it starts even with a script. There are so many writers who start writing and then they never even finish the script. So this process, despite the fact how the movie is coming out, not to your best vision and how you imagined it, keep going and getting to the end. Get that in the can because if you get the, the film, can. you can, as long as you have that editor that will like put it together, you can have something. and Something on your resume. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I remember like the producer of uh, I think it was the Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. He said he, he they made the film. It was low budget, and they went to cons, and like there was no one that came in the room to go screen, screen it. And he said there was this one guy that sat down. I think there was two guys. He said in the audience watching it, like <laughs> he only mm -hmm. had like two people out of like like yeah. two hundred seats. And the guy he said it was so funny. The producer told me he goes, the guy just sat there, and at the end he goes, you know what, this thing is terrible. <laughs> But I'm going to take it because it will sell. Yeah. And like he, he kind of knew like bad can be good. Yeah, yeah, it could yeah, be a cult yeah. classic. And so yeah. he said like this horrible produced movie, yeah. it could become it, like it got, it got sold. And yeah. so I just thought, wow, that's so, you know, like get something in the can, make a film, make yeah. a film. Yeah. Make Listen, a film. Um, I'm extremely proud of Unchained Film. Um, obviously, it is something that I'm also striving to be better and produce better and better quality as I'm moving on. But yeah, first time when I watched Unchained, it was like surreal experience that that's the movie. Like we made a movie. It's a movie <laughs> and it's insane. And of course we had those moments where we're like laughing uh, hysterically because it's, um, it, it's bad, but it's good. You know, it's that kind of thing. And just knowing your incredible journey and like how charming you are and you just like make life just like more pleasant. Like I bet you people are going to be lining up and calling. Go, I want to be on your set because you like you make everything like even an unpleasant situation. You make it like beautiful and romanticize it and you make you make it charming like you made your Hobbit house on the top of like Warner Brother Hill. You know, mm -hmm. you made a Hobbit house yeah, like, Hobbit uh, house. you know, but, yeah. but yeah. The, it's funny that the YouTube channel is actually what I really think one of my main objectives with youtube channel besides uh vlogging and sharing knowledge about producing because i i really want to do it i really want to share knowledge about producing because there's people don't people produ other producers for some reason don't like sharing the, the knowledge that they acquire i don't know why or at least when i was trying to find for some answers i couldn't find it so I feel like one of the greatest things that I can bring to the community and to other producers and filmmaking is my own knowledge that I already can share, that I already possess. But I'm also realizing that I'm still in the beginning of the journey. I consider myself a student and I have a lot of room to grow and get better and better. So 
I already have something to share. I know I'm going to learn even more. And I want to share all that knowledge with people through my YouTube channel. At the same time as I'm vlogging and showing it real in field producing how it's done. Recording all those crazy phone calls, recording all those crazy pitch meetings and all the shenanigans that is going on and how you're losing stuff, how you're finding back your way, way back again. You know, you lose an actor, you lose your budget, you lose, whatever, you know, stuff goes wrong every day. That's what I want to record and, and, and show the people. And hopefully that will also be an inspiration for other filmmakers um, besides just being an entertaining and funny because I think it is entertaining but the third goal is my with my YouTube channel is to create an online filmmaking community where people can network. What is the hardest thing for people when they're making films and trying to get something going? Connections. It is so hard to meet people when you have to go to these parties, you have to be on set. It means you have to get a job as a PA or whatever to get on set. It's, it's rarely when you go to a supermarket and all of a sudden it's a producer, right? Where do you find producers? It's hard, right? Well, guess what? Online erases all of these boundaries. And hopefully some people who are my age, other filmmakers, my age and younger age who are very digital savvy will join my online community and start networking through my YouTube channel and will get connections going. Get, start sharing projects, start helping each other out and making some stuff. I just feel like I have so much benefit to bring to the community through the channel that I'm, that I'm launching right now. So they're gonna ha- you're going to have to follow him on, what's your Twitter? Are you Twitter and Instagram or TikTok until you get this, uh, the YouTube channel up and running, right? I, I have, no, I have all, the YouTube channel is already running. Okay. Ilya Constantine. You can, you can Ilya find Constantine, yeah. and you can see that in the the description summary of the podcast. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I also have Instagram and Twitter. Um, I'm not super socially active. I'm trying to be. It's just already when you do three jobs at the same time. Yeah. You know, one more thing on top of it just adds even more complication. Yeah, that's what I told people. Like, um, I'm so busy running like three or four podcasts. I'm writing stories for Enchanting Book Readings podcast, which it's mm-hmm. like running a a, a TV channel because you need like to put a new story on every week and to come up with a new story or a continuation of like a cute kid story. It's like writing, directing, producing, editing, adding yeah. the music. It's like 15 hours yeah. and like, yeah. you know, just it, sto- good stories are like, you know, I'm learning to write as fast as I can and, yeah. and, 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 and make them as cute as you can. But normally it's a good story can take five years, 10 years, mm-hmm. 15 years, Absolutely. 20 years, a year. So to write something super fast. So I'm learning to write TV writing. So I like a lot of the stories are now like almost like TV episodes. So, yeah. you know, like Charlie and the Dolphin is like, I think he has like five episodes and, and it's, it's like fun to write, but, um, I have a script that I've been developing for four years already, four years in development, just one script. And I can't quite get it. It's just, and I, and I rewrote it already so many times that sometimes when I look at it, I, I get sick. But I'm going to finish it someday because it's, it's too good to abandon. Yeah. But I do know what you mean. Writing is challenging. A whole nother beast on itself. Yeah. And, 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 and you're writing like you're, you're working on the set. He's working on the studio. And yeah. so, yeah. Well, Ilya, is there um, anything else you'd like to share with us? Do you do anything for fun? Do you have any time for fun? <laughs> Honestly, no. I, kinda, <laughs> I need to. I want to. I want to travel. I really want to travel, and I do try to travel as much as I can whenever it allows me. But I'm just realizing right now it's time to grind. Yep. I'm all in the beast mode, in grinding <laughs> mode, uh, making those movies, making the TV show, making my YouTube channel successful, sharing the knowledge with people. I'm just very obsessed right now. I'm not. I'm, it's funny. I, I kind of coming. T- I came to this second wind. Or what, what's the saying? Like second. Second wind. I second think Second wind. So. That yeah. That's the, the expression. I'm finding my second wind finally. Almost like because I, I'm I'm getting excited seeing how things are manifesting and the way it's manifesting. I'm kind of like, and I'm also getting to that age where I'm already okay. It it is really time to get the fruits of my labor. <laughs> um, so I'm realizing it is time to put even more pressure forward 
keep going even more. And then fun is going to come later. Well, Ilya, I mean, I, I hope everyone that's been listening can be encouraged by Ilya because like his journey is so incredible from Russia with love um, coming to our country. And he made it. He made it as an actor, as a series regular. He made it as a producer. And now he has a hot, hot TV show. And then it's an incredible film that he's working with that I'm privy to know who one of the actors are. It's like, wow. Like he's really uh, this this producer he's he's you know he's it he's the bomb so please follow him on twitter and instagram follow me if you like and please subscribe and hit give us a nice review and uh thank you for listening everyone to the incredible guest we had today illy constantine thank you so much for being here today thank you so much i really appreciate it <laughs> hey guys don't give up keep moving forward and keep manifesting manifestation is real you just have to believe in it yeah, until next week, Filmatics, enjoy the show <laughs> and stay healthy. Bye-bye.